this is Casey from the Clinton County Public Library here in the local history branch um, in Covington. And today we're going to continue our series uh, with the adventures in the archives. Um, today we're going to talk about a lesser known collection, um, the Emily Orr collection here held in the archive. I figured it would be a seasonally appropriate collection to talk about on this um, snowy Wednesday. Emily Orr was a teacher and kind of a pioneer woman from Kentucky that went up to Alaska to teach um, and ended up staying there for quite a while and really immersing herself in the culture there. And we were lucky enough in the department to um, have her collection donated by her family. Um, and today I'm going to talk a little bit about what you find in that collection, um, some really cool items that you might not know about, so we'll get started. Uh, so a little bit of background about Emily Orr. Um, it was believed she was born in July of 1881 in Falmouth, Kentucky um, to Alexandra Orr, who was a doctor, and Patty Orr. From an early age, Emma knew that she wanted to be a teacher. And in 1903, her dream became a reality when she found a, a teaching job down in Falmouth. Um, however, Emma contracted an illness during that time period when she began teaching, and doctors believed that a cold climate would help her condition a little bit better. So, in 1903, Emma decided to set sail for the Alaskan Territory. And while there, she became a teacher, a writer, and an explorer during the next 12 years. Um, during her time up there, she wrote a number of books, one including um, Nancy's Adventures in Eskimo Land, which was published in 1952, and an unpublished draft um, called Mucklucks and Dog Sleds, which we have in the collection as well. Um, from one of the collection's um, letters, correspondence that you can find in this collection as well, uh, her literary agent, Mary E. Curtis, gave her some literary writing advice I thought was kind of funny. Um, she stated that uh, to reach the best market, she should write a book aimed at 8 to 12 year old age group and have no more than 25,000 to 30,000 words. And the book should also be exciting and colorful, but informative as well. I think she probably accomplished that with um, some of the books that she wrote. So in Alaska, uh, uh, Emma supported herself by teaching. She taught children um, of in the indigenous peoples as well in both Candle and Nomi towns up in Alaska. From 1903 to 1917, she taught at the Seward Peninsula Elementary School. And from 1918 to 1920, she held the position of superintendent of the Nomi Public School System. And during her time there, um, she immersed herself in the culture and customs of local people living in Alaska. She traveled by dog sled and visited a lot of mining and honey camps as well up there and got a lot of experience working with people doing those types of jobs. Um, she was also the first known white woman to own a herd of reindeer in the territory as well. And over the years, uh, she amassed a large collection of photographs, which I'll show you and talk a little bit about here in a minute. Uh, a lot of other memorabilia uh, in Alaska as well. And as I mentioned before, these were eventually donated to the department by her family members. And following her Alaskan experiences, um, Emily moved back to the greater Cincinnati area. And for many years afterwards, she lived at 401 Walls Avenue here in Covington with several of her sisters as well. Uh, she taught in the Cincinnati Public School System until she was forced to retire in 1953. Uh, most of her work in Cincinnati schools were teaching disabled children and other children with learning disabilities. And she is often remembered as being kind of a kind and caring mother figure to those kids. Um, she also conducted lectures for area groups on her past experiences in Alaska as well. Um, she died July 3rd, 1965 at San Elizabeth Hospital here in Covington, and she was survived by six nieces and three nephews. Uh, services for her were held at Madison Avenue Baptist Church in Covington, and she was buried out at Highland Cemetery in Fort Mitchell. So to talk a little bit more about what's actually held in this collection, um, we have about four folders of a lot of really, really cool um, pictures of Alaska, different animals there. And again, keeping with the holiday season, I definitely wanted to point out some of these really cool reindeer photographs. Um, I believe a lot of these she may not have taken herself. Some of these are from actually a company that she got photographs from and she saved. Um, so some of these are probably more professionally done, but she collected about four quarters worth of photographs of just animals, landscapes, things like that. Um, 
I really love this one of a walrus. That's pretty cool. Um, and again, she mentioned dog sleds, lots of photos of dog sleds, mushing things like that. So that's pretty interesting to look at. And then some also again some landscape photographs of all the mountains, lakes, things up there in Alaska. So doesn't quite look like that outside here, but um, we have our own snow going on today. Um, something else that was really interesting that I haven't seen in any of other collection here in the department are these um, screen printing um, intaglia blocks. Um, so again, if you don't kind of know what that is, screen printing, print making, um, basically the gist would be, you know, if you've got a shirt with an image, screen print on it. That's kind of what print making is. But these intaglia blocks, which I believe there's about four or five in the collection hole, but I believe these are probably used as for illustrations um, from their manuscript of mukluks and dog sleds. So in this one, I believe this is actually a photograph of her, an etching of her, um, probably from an author photo. But basically, her image is etched onto this metal plate. You would put ink down on this, and you would take your paper, roll it across, and there would be the image put on that paper from the ink. And again, there's quite a few um, blocks in there. Some of these, it's hard to tell in this one, but this looks to be sort of like a landscape scene. And there's a couple more of different scenes like this. I think there's probably like um, a dog sled one, I believe, as well. So kind of cool to see these in person. Um, there's also a lot of material in the collection of notes that she took while she was there. Um, I believe a lot of stuff that she wrote was later incorporated into some of her books as well. There's one I kind of wanted to read from that I thought was interesting, kind of gives a taste of her writing style. Um, this is about um, some encounters with wolves she had when she was in the Alaskan Territory. So, in the great white silence of the long Arctic night, no sound can tug at the heartstrings as the howl of the wolf dog. I have been startled by this mournful cry. It sounds as though a child has been lost in the merciless blizzard and was yelling for help. This clever dog musher has trained the, these beautiful dogs to put their very souls into the musical number. He merely whistles and they perform. Um, these Alaskan dogs not only entertain, but render a service to the people of the North. How well do I recall going out to meet the first dog that winter kneeled to the Arctic. True, the letters were two months old, but they are from loved ones and the age did not seem to matter. So as you can see, definitely has that colorful kind of writing style. Um, it would be definitely great for kids reading those books because it is informative. It gives you a real good description or sort of mindset of what she was going through during that time up there in the um, territories up there. Um, so really fun to read through some of her notes there to um, get a feel for what life was like there during that time period. And again, there aren't really a lot of photographs in the collection itself of her, but I do kind of want to show this is not the greatest newspaper clipping we found of her, but you can kind of see her as an older woman. I'm just thinking from her years probably teaching to when she was younger up in the Alaskan Territory. She has her nice warm um, hooded coat on there, sort of real fur during that time period. So. Definitely kept her nice and cozy when she was up there teaching children in um, Alaska. Um, I also wanted to point out that a big uh, portion of this collection or um, sort of audio recordings that she did and oral histories during her time period there. Um, the actual physical tapes are in the collection, but you can go online um, and listen to some of these as well. I listened to a couple in preparation for this video and they're really cool. Um, they're not super long, just kind of little anecdotes of her time up there. And you can actually find these on the website. It's going to be kentonlibrary.org backslash genealogy backslash Emma Lee or audios. So that's where all of her audios can be found. Um, and again, a lot of her photographs, um, a lot of these aren't, they have been, some of these have been digitized or not on faces and places, but they're on her actual um, kind of page that we have for her on the website. Um, that's again going to be at um, kentonlibrary.org back, backslash genealogy backslash um, Emily Orr. So if you want to find even more photographs from the collection, that's where those can be found.
And again, I hope you enjoyed this little video about Emily Orr, um, Alaskan Pioneer. Um, during the research, there was a lot of other videos mentioning her, so I think over time people will become more familiar with her story. Um, so I hope you had fun. Check us out again for another um, video for a big interest in the archives.